All right, you, you guys can see that it's recording? Right on. So I can't. Cheers, Edson. Nope, no beer. Just seltzer. Green tea, nope. Just very angry water. Okay, so today, it's kind of a, it's funny, I have a list of topics that I like to do every single week, and sometimes what I want to do gets interrupted between what I feel I have to do. Like, I feel like there's some necessity ones. Like, you guys can probably tell the webinars that I do that, like, I really want to do. Like, like moments that matter. Like, I was really excited about that one. Um, and, you know, I can't even remember, like, all the other ones. Like, Evolution of a Trader is one that I want to... This one is kind of one that I feel like I kind of have to do um, uh, just because one, I get a lot of DMs about it and one, like, I, I, like I'm still getting, um, it's still, it's still a flaw I see in all of the chart, chart recaps and stuff. And so today we're going to be talking about full size positions. We're going to, I mean, specifically, this is going to be a kind of like how to really technical, like let's dig into the chart and be how do we get into full size when it's the most appropriate, when to not be in full size, why we don't seem to get in full size and all, all, all that good stuff. So prep your questions on full size, ready to go. And um, yeah, so we'll get into that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, if this is your first webinar, welcome. Uh, I always go over the market sentiment of the week, um, and I could try to go over the key traders of the week. This week, I didn't trade shit, so um, I'll have you guys throw tickers at me on this one, and, and then I can kind of dissect the traders of the week, and we can kind of analyze them kind of together. I do have a rant that I have to rant about this week, um, and then we'll get into the full size. Um, anyway, um, yeah, anytime you have questions, uh, please feel free to, um, ask away. Um, there will be a small portion at the end. This one will probably be a, um, a shorter webinar, um, or, or not. We'll see. I, I'm anticipating maybe this one will be like a 15 minute shorter webinar though. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask them. And if I miss it, just post it again. I'll, you know, I, I try to keep an eye on the chat, but sometimes it's hard. Um, anyway, the webinars that will help you to watch that I might talk about a reference in this webinar is the add to a winner webinar and the moments that matter webinar. So if you haven't seen those, um, I mean, put them on the, put them on the queue. I don't know what numbers they are. I should have looked at that. I think add to win is 23 moments that matter. It's probably like, I don't even know what this one is, but it's probably somewhere like 50 pounding desk. Okay, so last week, where were we, right? You know, we were kind of in this, like, this ping pong here. Thanks, Selena. Uh, 58. Oh, holy shit. We're up. That, was, that one was 58? Well, oh, this one must be, like, 60-something. Um, anyway, so we were kind of in this, like, little 61. We were kind of in this little back and forth kind of ping pong between um, left and right. But it was kind of getting elderly, like, right? The market was slowly dying as we kind of did it. Like, it was just kind of slow back and forth kind of one week, one week, just back and forth with the control. And, you know, and we had finally broke it, right? We finally broke the all-time highs. And But the thing about last week's all-time high break was it felt a little bit anticlimactic just because it kind of just peaked over. But, um, you know, and basically the market's in full-on YOLO mode, right? YOLO mode right now. And as I said last week, right, that like – or last week's last week that um, – the anticlimacticness and not the burst through, um, I thought was a testament to like the ho-humness about, you know, like the lack of excitement because people may not feel that it's deserving. Um, but um, I wouldn't be surprised to have us, you know, kind of chill up here and maybe debate. Well, this week uh, kind of proved me the idiot again um, because, I mean, we actually did have that burst through. I mean, we're almost at 350. All-time highs was like 340. So we're – um, right now I feel like we're kind of in a little, we're in a little bit of a squeeze. I would actually say that this is probably a little bit of a squeeze and just because like we're, 
you know, we got this like this gap up green, green, green stuff. And I think it's just because people just didn't expect it. Probably a lot of shorts up here that are stopping out. So I'm guessing that's what it is. Um, I'm, I, I mean, I'm sure there's probably a bullish out, outlook now as, I mean, it seems like, again, not to get political, but I, I guess I think the market kind of runs on that a little bit. But like, it seems like we're seeing less COVID headlines and more rioting headlines. And so, you know, or rioting and protesting and stuff like that and um, racial injustice and all that kind of stuff. And so we're seeing like, that's more um, dominating the headlines a little bit and less so like all these cases, all these cases, all these cases. And you know, with, with the lack of all of the, look at these new cases, look at these new cases, look at these hospitals, look at the, the outbreaks and all that stuff. Because we, I mean, there's still a little bit of it, but the, just the mass decrease of that and the more focus on the racial injustice kind of um, you know, politics there. I think that's kind of just kind of quelled the fears just because people aren't being reminded of it every single day. You know, like just, oh, like outbreak, 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 blah, blah, blah. Like that's not the main focus point of the news anymore, it seems. And so like, I think that's kind of quelling some fears and we're, we might, you know, that, that could be helping us get above this. You know, like no one ever really knows, but you just kind of have to kind of take into the world sentiment here. And that's kind of what I, what I'm kind of, that's the vibe I'm feeling. So um cases on backside oh yeah yeah and and so this is i mean yeah we've definitely like we've definitely in the last couple months like we have um seen a lot less in the news like as far as coverage goes so um i think that's helping helping fuel the market and the thing about it is i honestly like if you're when you're a trader you honestly don't care what the catalyst is all you really care about is what's happening right and you know, what could be next? Why, why is what's happening happening? Doesn't matter if you were right or wrong, right? You just, you're just trying to figure out what the story is so that you can put, you know, potentially guess what's next. That's all, that's all our job is. So anyway, so this week, um, uh, it's kind of like a great, now what do we do market for? So and when I, the reason why I say that is because uh, anybody who uh, started trading this year, like anybody, this is like the first, what, what do I do? Like why, why all of a sudden is there nothing to trade or all my setups aren't happening, right? This is by, this is the closest to summer. We, I, this isn't even summer really. Like we still have, dude, we still have gappers every day. Now they're not as good. Like they're 30%. Like, like back when I started trading 30%, a 30% gapper was a lot. I don't, I don't, I don't know what changed 30, 30% gappers. Like that used to be my minimum. Like I would only trade it if it was up. Like that used to be my minimum cut. I would trade it if it's up 30. Now I look at 30 and I laugh at it. I'm like, now my minimum's like 75, 90 is like a minimum kind of stuff. And so, um, you know what else changed is like, 30 to 40, 30 to 40 million shares on the day used to be the biggest volume stocks. Now we get to 30, 40 million in the first 10 minutes. So that's definitely changed. But um, the thing is for, for, for these new, for newer traders that started maybe, you know, kind of late 20, even late 2019, right? This is your first kind of dosage of what a summer is like. And, Summers can get even worse than this. It, I mean, you can log into the market, open up your DAS, and, and, and literally there are no gappers. There is nothing. You get APR, it pops up 20 cents, and that's it, right? And so that's like what a true summer is where there's like nothing. We're still getting a little bit, but it's definitely the first, I'm going to call it, dead market of 2020. And here's the good news. The good news about this is that we're already in late August, right? And the first quarter starts, uh, what, September, October, um, um, November, December, yeah. So we're like a month away from like the fourth quarter, right? We're a month away from the fourth quarter. And um, it's like the fourth quarter typically isn't that slow. So like if basically if this is going to be the summer, like, like August through September, we can manage that. We can easily survive that. Like I don't think that uh, – it's, it's anything to worry about. And again, it kind of coincides with that kind of like decreasing COVID uh, alarmism, right? The alarmism of COVID has kind of gone down. That's probably what's helping the market go up and what's probably 
finally, I mean, that's what, that's what kept, that's what kept 2020 going throughout the typical, you know, June, July, summer months, right? It's the COVID, right? But now that we're starting to see that decrease in COVID alarmism, you know, we're starting to see that, you know, the market is finally taking a break. The market's finally cooling down because, I mean, people see a COVID PR and eventually, right? I talked about this months ago. It just happened. It just, it just really extended way farther than I thought, right? A month ago, I said, all right, so this is, this is how, um, what, gosh, what, I'm blanking. What's the, what's the word? Um, uh, is it a sector? No, it's not a sector. It might be a sector like the shipping. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sector. When these sector plays go off, right. Whether it's shipper, China, tech, energy, um, COVID, right. We had a sector, um, you know, whenever you have like a sector push, well at the tail end of the sector is when people stop caring about the PRs. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. People stop caring about these, these, these PRs. And that's when all of the gappers tend to just crap. And so we're kind of seeing that, right? When COVID PRs come up, people don't care, right? People just don't care. Like we're, you know, like people think that like bigger companies are on, on the, like we're already starting to get an edge of the vaccine kind of stuff. So these small cap PRs that put out like COVID bullshit, nobody gives a shit anymore. So um, we're starting to see that. And I, months ago I said, when we start to see the tail end of this, that's going to be the short time to really just nail on all of the shitty fluffy PRs, right? So I think we're kind of entering into that realm because we're starting to see like literally no momentum coming from this, from this COVID. So we might actually, um, I don't know what's going to be next after COVID. Nobody does, but um, like we might be seeing the death of the, of, of the COVID kind of small cap hotness here. Oh, Bitcoin was another one, right? Yeah. So, so we're, we're probably, I'm just, I know, do I want to go on a limb and say that we are, at the end of it, sure, I'll take a guess. I, I would say maybe we are, and it's kind of coinciding with the market at all-time highs and all this stuff. So if that's the case, then my game plan for um, the COVID PRs, basically, it's going to be just short bias on all of them. Um, unless, of course, you know, you get a nice technical long setup or something. I'll probably short bias on all of them. So anyway, you can see that the range this week and last, but especially this week, has significant, has drastically decreased. Literally, I felt really boring the last like six months of webinars where like I'm literally just like the range is like over here and I'm moving it an inch and inch and inch. And you guys are probably like, yeah, the range, that this is such an unimportant indicator because it never changes. Well, here it's finally changed, right? We're at the, the lowest range we've been in the entire market. We're not seeing really much of anything. We're seeing tight range stocks being the only stocks that move. And the stocks that are moving like, you know, like they're barely breaking levels. Like it's not, we're not seeing any like 100 to 300 to 500% crap anymore. So the range is significantly down. And as, as traders who trade off volatility, that, I mean, it, that just immediately coincides with the dead market. And so it, it makes it very more difficult for us to make money on that kind of environment. One, even if you're a short, even if you're an all day fader short, a stock, I mean, it's not gonna give you a good entry opportunity and it's just going to tank. You're not going to really want to really short big down there. And it's then the range is going to slowly trickle. And it, it, it's also harder for, for faders too. So anyway, so the shorts definitely have the control in these two markets. They tend to have the control as momentum confidence is pretty much at all time lows right now, especially for all time this year, all time lows for this year. Uh, yeah. Neo is not really a small cap though, but uh, yeah. Yeah, Neo, Neo's definitely been a beast these last, this last week. Um, anyway, but the action, it's basically crickets, really, right? Not much of anything, really crappy range. Overcrowdedness on the one to two plays we actually do get. You know, like, we're really seeing the overcrowdedness thing has definitely increased because all of this volume, like this 40, 50, 61 billion shares of volume has to get put somewhere, right? All that volume that everyone's used to trading has to get put somewhere. So the second we get a play... Like someone even like tagged me and said like I bet Austin would call VBIV a fuckboy stock or something like that. Well, yeah, like when everyone's trading the same stock, that stock's gonna be a fuckboy stock, right? It's just it's just gonna trigger stops, short stops, long stops, no rhyme or reason. It's just gonna kind of be a pain in the ass. But anyway, um, you do have to be careful, and when I I especially mean shorts right now, longs kind of already know to be careful in this market. But if you're a short, 
this is where your bad habits are formed. And, I, and I'm not just talking about the obvious impatient bad habit, like where, you know, you just get impatient short and get rewarded or you, you know, crappy trade selections where you're just kind of trading crappy stuff or crappy setups and kind of just, you're not getting that punished for it. Um, or even being rewarded. But the most important bad habit you're forming is actually like not getting punished is the worst form. Like getting rewarded is, is bad. Not getting punished. Like, I mean, it's kind of the same thing, but when, when you have a shitty chase entry or just trading a bad stock or something that you shouldn't even be trading and, and um, you don't like take a loss from it, even if you just get break even on it. Right. That it basically taught you that it was okay to do that. Right. This is where the bad habits are formed. And so you really have to be careful about not changing your process or your style too much because put it this, because the, the dead market is the, is the minority in, in the, in, in the market. The market is typically pretty busy, right? The market likes to be busy. PRs like to happen. Especially normally when markets at all time highs, the market is busy, but I think it's this COVID thing, right? Like we're, we're seeing the small caps is seeing the end of the COVID, whereas large caps is seeing the end of the COVID. So that's kind of why we're probably seeing the disconnect. Um, but you guys have to know that like a dead market is typically the minority market. So you don't want to be basing your strat, like creating strategies in this kind of no momentum market. Normally momentum is a big factor in the market and you have to kind of respect it. Don't just, you know, expect that this no momentum trading is just going to be around forever. So be careful that you don't form these bad habits with this kind of action that we're seeing here. The patterns that, that I've, that I've noticed have been really working. Um, simplest shorts have been really good. I, I, I nailed a couple of them this week and last week. Um, death candles, obviously really good because momentum is already weak. So once you get a death candle, like it's kind of, there's no coming back from that in, in a momentum less market. When you get a death candle that supposedly kills momentum, you're killing like a little, a bug about this big, like you're like the death candles, like stepping on a cockroach, like the, the cock or cockroach, not a good example. Cockroaches never die, but you know, you get what I'm saying? Like the death candles literally squashing something like really small. So death candles are a really good setup. Death lines are a really good setup. Death lines and death candles are both momentum killer strategies. Um, so, you know, those have been really good. And simplest short is, is kind of another anti-momentum strategy. It's once the first potential top is in, people start saying, well, that's it, right? So the, the, the momentum killing kind of strategies are what's working because the momentum is the weakest in the market. But basically this week is just kind of like a continuation of last week, right? We're seeing... Um, a lot more range bound holds um, uh, strategies were um, the, pr uh, the pr what, why did I say that? The problem is light, right? Um, I, I, um, I, one thing I've been noticing is that simplest shorts in pre-market have been working really well. And that's because, like I said, like these COVID PRs aren't having the same like pre-market up, 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 upness that they've been having in this, in the last like couple months. And so they've been doing really well in these slow and short and momentumless markets. So that's one thing that I'm probably going to take note of um, going forward, not just in pre-market, but just overall, when we kind of enter here, this is the time like when, when momentum is really at the alt is at a weak point. That's when simpler shorts tend to work. Simpler shorts tend to really fail when like you're in a buyer's market and as a hard pull, you're in a buyer's market with momentum. It, it, it can have a hard pull, get a pop, you short the pop and it breaks the high. I can't tell you like that's happened so many times. So it's like simply short seems to be one of those kind of tag on to the shorts market when you want to do that. Uh, right. And these last couple of weeks, I've really noticed it in pre-market. Um, anyway, what do I think is next? Um, I, you know, I don't think anyone can guess how long we're going to be in a dead market, but I would guess at least for another week that get ready for this. Maybe, maybe through the end of September even. Um, but we just have to endure this, right? Um, and, you know, we'll reassess next, next week, of course, but all of 2020 has been incredibly just just busy, busy, busy. So a cool down is pretty natural for all of you <laughs> spoiled brats. Um, I expect a lot more pre-market death in the, in the next coming week. I expect, or not more, but I expect that to continue. Uh, but I don't think um, it can last for long considering it's August. Oh my God, dude. Pepe memes, like, dude, Pepe memes for trading is, like, so perfect. <laughs> like, the, my favorite one, 
my favorite Pepe meme for trading is is the is the little one that where he's like that and it's like it's like when you get a scalp after just at when when you're almost at max loss and get a hundred dollar scalp. Like, yay, like it's so happy, like some hope in my life. Like <laughs> it's so funny, dude. But anyway, definitely in the dead market. And overall, yeah, I mean, look, there's everything. I, Carve is not supposed to be green. Carve, I don't know how that, no, this is supposed to be red. Yeah, literally, there, there's no green in this market, uh, in small cap land. Like, it's literally, everything's death. Large cap's doing amazing. Um, the only bullish factor that we have out here is that it's literally fourth quarter. We're literally almost in fourth quarter. So that that's probably going to likely, hopefully, put a can to the summer. That looks like my p &L. Oh, gosh. But anyway, um, yeah. So if you're along, good. I mean, good luck, man. It's really difficult. Like, I'm, I'm more of a long, and I like to just – I've just been toning it back. Um, and I want to talk about that after, once I finish this slide, various factors, obviously the works that works, death candle stuff, GIVO, XSPA offering, and even, even the, uh, actually I'm kind of lazy. I didn't see the end of PED today, but didn't it like epically gap down? Yeah. Yeah. So that should have happened. Yeah. So that should be, yeah. GIVO, XSPA, uh, offering and this PED just tank. The pre-market depth we've been seeing, just overall less plays, kind of this confirmed summerness. That's definitely a bearish factor. SGLB and caper depth, like that, 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 that kind of started off the week with us. And the fact that like it's been really hard to get borrows on literally every single play. And as longs know and shorts, like like longs get excited when you, you're lo when there's a stock that's popping up and the borrows really available, like. I get, I like, I like, I'm like that, that, that black guy in the yellow corduroy, like sweater meme, dude, like, like you're just ready. Right. Like, but when like the borrows on these plays have been really tough. Yeah. The borrows on these plays have just been really hard um, to get. And I mean, that just, a, that makes me like not want to really long them. And I'll kind of go over that in a little bit, but anyway, what's next? The point of, What's in the, in the overall market? The point is don't find the trend. This spy seems to be in a, in a squeeze um, as people likely banked on what I banked on, right? And I'll admit I was wrong. And, but I, I remember saying that like I could be wrong and that price action is king and that still holds today. Right? I, still, I still do have doubts about the staying power up here going into the election because we went over that a couple webinars ago where, I, where we kind of looked at the market tends to hesitate right before elections just because there's so much hesitation. I still, I have no reason to believe that that's not going to be the case this year. I, this can be a little squeeze. We'll reassess it in like a month and see like if, if we're at 370, I guess I'm wrong today, but I still have doubts about the staying power up here or, you know, at least the, you know, that's, you know, what's the next big level 400. Yeah. I don't, I don't see that anytime soon. Um, I couldn't borrow a bag of sugar late. Exactly. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to try to guess the top of the squeeze, but that's what I think is what's, what's happening. COVID fear seems to, have, seems to have lost its edge in the market. And that's why, we, um, and that's why that this normalcy kind of perhaps like we might see this normalcy resume. The election should still offer the hesitance. And so I, I put a picture of Gary here because that's me looking at this market right now. I was like, what's going on over here? Like, Anyway, so yeah. Oh God, what was I just about to talk about? Oh yeah, the um, oh yeah, with no borrows and and um, as a long, when when there's no borrows as a long, I really, 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 really have like I'm very quick with my targets. By the way, like when I when I when I'm trading a stock long, and I know there's a good healthy borrow, um then I'm not even afraid to buy dips because I know shorts are slamming it, right? I know that like I can buy a dip, shorts are going to slam it and they'll pro you know, the, the impatient ones are probably going to cover it. I have a lot more confidence buying those dips. I have a lot more confidence buying the strength because I know covers are going to follow me. But the, the explosive power of stocks, I just don't have when there's no borrows. And 
every other long knows this. And that's, you know, that psychological that people like this longs knowing that they're not going to like chase highs that much. And so if longs aren't chasing highs and that's just half the demand gone. And we say that's half of the demand. If there's no shorts, it's probably three quarters of the demand gone. Right. And so that's kind of that it really, it's a huge indicator for, for longs. Anyway, so one thing I want to talk about is C CJX was a stock today, by the way. And so now's the time if you guys want to post tickers for me to go over, um, we, we can go over them. Um, cause I, I won't, I, I only have like two or three today. So if you have tickers that you want me to go over and kind of, kind of analyze a little bit, now's the time. But yeah, CGIX was a stock. I actually longed it and I made money. Um, I just didn't make a lot of money um, because I, I didn't have a lot of faith in it. But um, like, okay, what's first? So bottoms first, right? Um, yeah, so this was, I think, right after I longed it. Like I, I, I longed it here. I longed it here, like somewhere on, on, on this VWAP reclaim candle here. And I sold it up here just because I was like, I just don't have faith in it. And so I, I remember in, on this day, I, I, I wrote this chain of, of um, things, ch this chain of God commentary on CGIX in the main chat. And I was like, in a different market environment and a different borrow situation, what I just talked about, CGIX could have gotten nutty and fun, but you have to take these into account with your targets. And that's why I say whenever a stock doesn't have a borrow, I reduce my target, right? I knew nine could potentially be a pain in the ass and stuffy before I longed it. Now I'm buying here at like eight ish on the VWAP reclaim, knowing that nine could potentially stunt it. Right. And like, here's the thing when, when people ask like, how do you know where you want your targets? Well, this is an example of how I set a target, right? Um, I put a target out at nine in my mind. I'm like, I know I'm going to sell some at nine. I would like it to go to 10, right? That's ultimately what I wanted. I, I'll buy nine and I hope it goes to 10. But if it starts to stall at nine, I'm probably going to sell it all at nine, sell it all at nine. And so that's kind of how I have like almost like a flexible target. Like, so like, you know, like people ask, how do you get the top? Well, you almost have to be a little flexible and be willing to not get the top or be willing to sell early. Like if I sold it all at nine because it was stuffy and it went to 10, I would have missed it. But anyway, and so I, I, I said like CJX, I think the range, I think, I think has the range to pops to nine again but it's a tough long there as this is tough to anticipate, likely leaving it alone for the same reason. So when it dipped down here, I was like, I think it can make it back up to nines again, but this is, um, but uh, it has the range, like this one actually had good range, one of the few of the week that had good range, but this is a really hard stock to anticipate, meaning like just buy it down here after it slammed and rejected nine, right? It's really kind of tough to anticipate that. And if you don't anticipate it and you're kind of buying up here when this is not the first VWAP reclaim, it's really tough to anticipate. And that's why I left it alone. And so I was like, I did think that CGIX was a tough short as well, but I did think it was the right side to be on, but it's not worth having size on. And this kind of gets into what I'm going to talk about full size. This stock, albeit I thought it was a short, you know, eventually, I didn't think that it was um, worth having size on unless it was under VWAP because it was too risky, right? It's just, and what makes it too risky? It has the range, right? You look at the stock and it does have range. Like this stock, like can, this stock can move from eight to nine and two to three candles. That's not something that you really want to have size on the position, right? So this is, this is an example um, where like, like and, and then right here, like when it broke 950 here, as a long, I didn't like that it broke 950 and then made it to like 980 and gave it trouble, right? That, and that really sealed the deal. Like, I think this is a short, but it's not worth having size on. Um, oh, this was a uh, nice, I was congratulating someone for a dip by here. Um, and I said, I, and right at around like, yeah, for like 1005 here, I just didn't think it had the explosive potential. It, you know, it had more of that grindy kind of, that kind of either a grindy up or a pullback, uh, uh, like a deep pullback kind of deep bounce, like really hard to trade stuff, deep pullbacks and, and, and harsh rips that like the, kind of like it did that stuff's really hard to trade. And it's also really hard to trade when it's grindy. Like when it's in that middle sweet spot, 
that's when it's kind of nice and easier to kind of guess. But when it has these deep, harsh pulls and deep and, you know, rip recoveries or the flip side, that super grindy action, those are both really hard to trade. And I, I felt it was going to be kind of one of, you know, you know, one of those. And so, you know, like I, I just left it alone, but the thing, and then the last thing I wanted to say was that CJX, it's forming a trend. So if you are short, which I actually thought was the right side, you still have to respect that like this is holding, this is holding, this is holding, higher lows are holding. Until the higher low doesn't hold, then you can kind of get a little bit more aggressive. And this is an example. I mean, I, I want to revisit this when I go into full size. Remind me. I don't want to talk about full size yet, but we'll talk about full size on this chart. Um, I didn't have a borrow on this, though, or I would have actually shorted this one. But yeah, I mean, that's why, that's partially why I didn't want to long it, right? Because there wasn't a borrow. If there was a borrow, uh, I might have wanted to long it. It depends on how much the borrow would have been. Uh, anyway, oh, do I have more on this? Um, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, have to come, I'll have to come back to this chart. I'll come back to this slide. Remind me to come back to this slide. I want to do this little slide later. Anyway, uh, so I so basically CJX, this was my trade on it. I just bought the VWAP reclaim and and sold into 950. Um, because it's uh, kind of just what I said. It's a VWAP reclaim. It didn't have power. I didn't like that at VWAP reclaim. And I thought it could run into resistance at nine. And it did. I was like, well, shit, I'm probably selling it all right here. And it did. Like, good thing I did because it dropped massively to 750. If the stock is hard to borrow and has options available, do I trade the put options? I don't trade options. I should, but I don't know. I'm kind of lazy. Um, I mean, obviously, it's kind of like the small caps of large caps. Like, I should. Um, yeah, it's just a VWAP reclaim, no power. If it was going up, it was going to do so either grindy or rangy, kind of what I just talked about, right? If this was going to go up, it would have been grindy or it would have been rangy, right? And both of those I'm not good at, so I don't like to be a part of it. I like taking the shots that I like to take and very few shorts. So that was a CJX trade. SGLB, I didn't trade this one, but I wanted to go over it. Like this is just the power of no borrow and the power of the dead market, the power of a nice simple short here, but there was no borrow. Like if there was a borrow here, I probably would have simply shorted that right into 750. Um, but yeah, it's like, this is the kind of stuff that you get when there's no borrow and a dead market. Like this is why as a long, you can't be buying anything right now pre-market you have to be waiting you have to wait for anything wait for the open and wait for like a true volume setup otherwise and a bar like you want like as a long you shouldn't be trading anything unless it has high volume and a borrow like that's the only thing that you should be longing right now it needs to have high volume and needs to have a borrow otherwise don't even think about it um Sorry to jump back and forth. I remember what I wanted to talk about on this slide, on the market center. So um, I'm bouncing back and forth, a little unorganized today, but I remembered what I wanted to talk about. So what I wanted to talk about in, like about the market sentiment is, this is a really dead market, guys. And um, here's the thing, right? This week, I am taking an advantage right now. I am using this time as an advantage. I'm almost giving myself a free week off. Right. Here's the thing. Like, I bet if you drew a chart between number of good plays, right, like number of good plays, volume and range and volatility, which we traders like um, and, and all this good stuff. Like you made a chart of like how it's been 2020. It, it's kind of been like slowly uptrending, like like big spikes, pullbacks, but staying really high. Right. And then it would and then it just dropped off here. Well, I'm sure your P&L probably follows, right? Because the good setups come with the volatility and the range and the volume, right? That's where the good setups come from. And so, like, I basically don't want my P&L to fall. And the way I see it is it's not exactly worth it. And one thing I've learned trading in these last, gosh, almost six years is you need to take breaks. And the market slowing down is almost like the market saying, take your break now because when you try to stay and force forget that you're going to lose some money along the way like that sucks what really sucks is that like 
your mind then goes down with the with those other lines on those charts your mind goes into the gutter like that and right now by kind of like literally like like i've been waking for me i've been waking up at 3 a.m every morning that's 30 minutes before the market opens right like i've literally i force myself to wake up later so that i can't fomo pre-market i've been doing that like I am forcing myself to kind of take off. Like I'm only saying the first 30 minutes. I'm only saying the first hour max. And I'm barely, I'm not even making any trades. Like, so it's like, I'm kind of like on a little mini vacation. And the thing is that I, I'm not like gone. I'm still looking. I'm still here. I'm still ready to take advantage of an opportunity. If, um, if it, well, 3 a.m. is late for me. I normally wake up at one, but, um, the thing is, is that like when like you need to take breaks throughout the year or you're going to get burned out. And so why not when the market is taking a break, you, sh you need to take a break with it. Like this is not the time to push. This is not this is not the time to test out new strategies. This is the time to like the thing is that I understand like that I'm not going to resonate with a whole lot of people here. A lot of you guys are probably like first year traders, maybe even second year traders, but who, and you don't have that burnout, but like, you'll get it. You'll get the burnout and like, you'll get the whole, like, I mean, time away from the screens, just mental, like kind of taking that, that off. Like it really helps. Like I, I've really enjoyed, like this week has been so fun. And, and what I've learned is that you know, I've just been having meme fun all over in the chat. And so basically what I'm doing right now is my mental state is up here. Now the market fell. But by avoiding following the market down into the gutter, my mind and my freshness, like I'm still fresh to trade. I'm still, if an opportunity comes, I'm still super fresh. So like when the market comes back, I'm going to be like, they're ready to be a hundred percent. I'm not going to like, I, I'm not saying that if I do trade that I'm going to be, that I'm going to lose. And that like, and even if I do lose that, I'm not going to be able to recover from it. But there's a significantly greater chance that a, I am going to lose and a, my mind will be affected by the losses that I may or may not take if I do, you know, decide to try to continue my, my P and L through this crap. So I'm, I'm basically just trying to like, you know, the, the market took a break and I'll say, I'll see you later when you come back. Right. And so that's kind of what I really wanted to go over on the slide, but I just forgot. Um, but yeah. So like that, I mean, you see me like, being all like abstained in chat. This is the reason why, like I just, I've learned my lesson. Like the opportunity cost when the market comes back is way greater than what I might lose. It's the thing is I might lose and I might be like, oh, I'm kind of not feeling it. And like, I might be a little bit more trigger shy. I mean, that's, that still happens. I might be a little bit more trigger shy um, when the market comes back and the opportunity is great. And I'm just kind of like in, let, let me just kind of crawl back and make back the money that I stupidly lost mode. Right. And so I don't want to be in that. I just want to be ready to go. I want to have a fresh brain. I don't want to be like just feeling like the market drained me because I'm sitting there for hours searching for a 10 cent trade. So I've kind of taken this week off, like mentally. I'm still here every day, but mentally I'm kind of off. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to talk about there. Uh, power of the dead market. Um, caper. I mean, this was a little, this was a little, um, simplest short that I took pre-market and this is kind of, this was a trade I took last week, Craig, and this was caper this week. Um, this was a simplest short in pre-market. Something that I've been noticing has been working really well on this dead market and probably maybe what I might just do, um, just go for simplest shorts this week and try to keep it really simple. Um, but I would, you know, this is a way that I try to use the market sentiment to my advantage. I basically just, I didn't believe it. Caper popped up, a big pop up from five to seven, right? And I was on some, I don't even remember what fucking PR, but it's Caper. And I'm just like, whatever. Like I in this market, whatever fluffy bullshit PR it is, I don't believe it's I don't believe it's gonna have any sustaining power at all. So I just like I'll short it. Like I I just waited for it to top out. It topped out at seven, pulled back harshly to six fifty. I'm like, I'll short six ninety. And that's you know, just immediate reject and this eventually went way lower and so here hindsight i should have held some and i normally like i normally like um want to make sure that i don't just let hindsight dictate um 
like most of the time I'll cover, it'll go lower. I'll say I'm happy where I covered this time because I was using market sentiment for my entry, like, and for the reasoning of the trade that I just didn't believe it. I thought it would fade back. I really should have kept some on, but I mean, it's just so habit for me to just take it all off kind of initially pre-market on that simplest short, you get the pull and that's it. And so like, I really should have kept on like a quarter or something for like six, but I didn't, but like next time I will. Like that, that's an improvement I think I can make. If I'm going to be using the market sentiment to enter, I might as well use the market sentiment, you know, using the same reasoning for a lower exit, right? If I really am kind of using this deadness, this, I don't believe anything has any kind of sustaining power and everything's going to fade kind of mentality for my trades, then I should kind of see it through all the way, right? And so this is something that like, this next week I will try to be better at. Like I, I will try, like if I, if I take a short like this one, I will try to have a lower cover next time. I'm typically more of a nail and bail, but I mean, it makes sense to hold lower. So I'm, I'm going to try and hold lower next week. And yeah. And so, yeah, it went way lower. Um, should have held some. Normally I'd resort the balance. Of course I would have, but no balance. And this is the exact same trade I took as Craig last week, right? There was a chat room in here, just the same as it was in here. This one topped out at five. This one topped out at seven. Um, you know, kind of pushed up. And I liked five here better, which is, um, than I did like seven. Like seven is more of a weirder number than five. Five is definitely all that, that, that super psychological number. So, um, but basically the same kind of trade. Simple short, pre-market, whole dollar reject, chat room in. Basically, I, like identi like word for word, the exact same trade. Um, but should I hold lower if under PDT and if you're under PDT and you should probably just take it like I did. I mean, the thing, every broker has a different rule on how I, I thought that you could have one. I'm not sure. I, I know different brokers kind of have different, like semi slightly different rules on the PDT, like on entry, entry, exit, exit, entry, exit, entry is another one. So I don't know exactly what your rules are. You like, if you want to hold like a little bit for lower, or if you're trading really small that the fees add up, I'd probably take it the way I did here. Um, just the classic nail and bail, get used to nailing and bailing. Don't try, don't try anything fancy. Don't try to change a process. If you were a newer trader, just go for that classic normal cover kind of spot. Um, but you know, if you, you know, I, I don't know what rules you got, but probably best actually just to stick to the process here. You know, just don't, don't get used to changing on the market. Um, what was the second set of trades on Craig? I mean, this is last week. I went over this last week. I mean, this was just a, just a short back. This was just a short back into this. I think a chat room bought again, but I was com I was confident that this breakdown would hold. Um, Trade drew is one direction, short, short, short covers, one trade. That's really cool. That's really cool. I think, I think, I think kind of brokers have changed a little bit in, um, since when I first started, but that sounds really, that sounds really kind of doable. Um, anyway, it basically, I just want to show these are the exact same trades here. Yeah, they look different, but I mean, the reasoning, the, the reasoning, the methodology, the variables, the, the strategy, the, the entries, the exits, all pretty much the same. Where am I here? Okay, so um, any, other, any other tickers you want me to go over? I saw VVPR. Uh, I saw MOXC, VBIV, and VVPR. So what did we have here? We had MOX. Oh, by the way, I was I actually did have one short. I was gonna trade once today on VBIV. I had a 487 short. I remember I had a 487 short right here. So pissed. I'm <laughs> so pissed. Going for a little first resistance off five. I'm like, this will be the only trade I take today. I had a 487 short right here. And I was so mad. I was like, are you serious? That was annoying. Anyway, and I would have covered right there. You know, I would have covered 60, I would have covered 63. 
been done with the trade. That would have been my trade for the day. Um, just enough to ease the FOMO. But anyway, oh yeah, so VBIV. So this one today was the, the royal pain in the ass today. Um, and so what do we have going on here? So the first thing that I do on this kind of stock is I look on the daily, right? And so 525, um, and what, 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 where did we open at? We opened at 416. So you got 450 here and five, 520, right? And so when we have this kind of pre-market chart, All right, we're opening into the pre-market for it recognized 450. Um, and so, yeah. And so I think I remember commenting on this. Let me, let's not look at, let's not look ahead. And so this is a good example of when I talked about last week, when I, when I had the webinar, um, I had the webinar called be careful what you wish for. And when we're going into the open like this, um, this stock is pretty dead, pretty below view up. And here's the thing. There's probably some fantasy orders um, in the 30s and 40s. I'd be willing to bet that there's fantasy orders in the 30s and 40s. Um, and so here, here's what happens at the open. Look at that. In the first two minutes, like we pop up there. Like from 410, from 410, we pop up to 3040, right? And so last week in the Be Careful What You Wish For webinar, you know, I kind of brought up this this point somewhere where did I have it here you never want a, yeah you never want a stock that went from weak to strong you never want a short a stock that went from weak to strong and so what are a couple ways to identify that this was weak to strong. Well, here we are, you know, we're testing here at like, you know, all the short C is if we break four, 407, then we can go break four, domino down, cover 390. That's what short C out of this stock. I know I'm a short, right? If I'm shorting this stock, kind of sub view, I'm thinking fade and crack at the open, right? This is what I see. So I see that there are shorts down here hoping for this fade, the chasers. And there's also people, some VWAP shorts, but there's also some fantasy orders here. So here's the thing. When this pops up and hits all of them, all of them in one swipe, right? Like if you did a two minute chart, it's in one swipe, right? You do a two minute chart, it's in one swipe. Not like I really do that. But right, you go all the way up here to 40s, right? Like um, you, you, get, you get up there in one swipe and everybody gets filled right there. Everyone's filled short. And the stock is at 430. And I think I mentioned something in chat. And I said, be careful that this push could have trapped. Like I said, it right at it happened. This stock could have trapped everybody right here. Be careful if it stays. We're going to, you know, we can squeeze higher. And like, and so this is what I mean when it stays, right? You're chilling above VWAP. And this is another, right? Obviously, you go from sub VWAP to VWAP. From, from sub VWAP, strong push over VWAP, that is from weak to strong. That's not something that you typically want to short. So if you got caught, oh, you know, be wary of this next time. And like, and you see this like one minute hold, two minute hold, three minute hold, four minute hold, five. I mean, it's holding above VWAP after it filled everybody short. Remember, these guys are short, the VWAP shorters are short, and these fantasy guys are short and not happy because they didn't get filled on the fantasy and it, and it dropped, right? That would have made them comfortable. So these guys are not happy. These guys are not happy. And these guys are not comfortable, right? So you have not happy, not happy, not comfortable because it went immediately from weak to strong. And so, I mean, naturally it squeezes, right? Naturally it squeezes. Yeah, I would consider this, I would definitely consider that a short chat because the, the, the strong move happened too fast, right? Like, you know, if, if, if it's slower, if it pushes, if it kind of rejects harshly, like if this reject would have came back sub view up, different story, right? But it held and it stayed. And that's what caused the trap is because it kept people, it kept shorts unhappy for a long enough period of time. And of course, this was the easy to borrow one, right? So naturally, you have a lot more shorts than because everyone can short this one. And 
for a week, there's been no borrows on anything. So everyone's shorting this one because they can. So um, it just, I mean, it's naturally a good, um, it's, it's, it, it's natural that you have to be care. It's this kind of squeeze. Let me phrase this. This kind of squeeze can happen just naturally. So as a short, you need to be weary when a stock goes from weak to strong like that. Um, and, and that's kind of what I was talking about last webinar, but, and, and then, and, and this is where it just becomes a big fuck boy stock where it's just like now everybody's trading it. It's so hard. And like, I, I wanted one first resistance short off of five. And you, you, you guys know that on first resistance shorts, I like them to stop early, which is why I had 87. Um, and I wanted 87 because I felt if we got to nineties, maybe we could push over five because nineties is nineties is kind of strong. Like psychologically, when I see nineties on, on, like if I see a stock go to nineties, um, I, I just think, well, it wants to test the dollar or whatever it is. So, um, yeah. And so this is where it just got really hard. And, and if you were still trading it over here, like you're a masochist, like, it, I mean, it's everybody in the world's trading this, like, this is what everybody's trading. Like it, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a headache. And so you kind of have to just know that, know that right it's above the i mean all the signs are there it's above the up higher lows it's easy to borrow if you got all that factors in here it's just a big pain in the ass um uh vvpr um what it was it was this a mover oh this is probably the day that people want to talk about oh what well, was that free market was that the, the prior day this was the prior day. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So when you come into here, this was the 24th. Oh, and this was, oh, this is after hours. Got it. Yeah. After hours popped up there. Okay. okay. And then you have this push up to five. Now I got it. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, this was actually a solid trade. I mean, you, you know, you kind of just have just a, a basic line short on here. Someone actually messaged me about this and here's, here, here's what I want to talk about. Like, this is a really good example of uh, starting late and starting slow and kind of like how you can use that one here. When you have one really solid line, the, the, the starting late and the starting late and starting slow strategy would say, just put your order at 550 small order and just kind of give it an hour. Right. That's kind of like the start low and start late webinar. I think that's, I, I think I called it the, the powerful pair or something. That's a webinar I talked about that. This is the only really trade setup I saw on this. There was a VWAP reclaim down here. I mean, look at the volume. You can't, you can't take this trade on the VWAP reclaim trade. You can't really take this. Like that's really hard. Like, like it's, in, it's in the middle of the day. Like you, you got it. Like this is hard. Like you can put a stab on here, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Did news come out? Maybe then, like, because the line, like, I don't know. This is a very hard long to capture because of the low volume makes it really difficult to catch on your radar. And in this this week where longs kind of suck, this and, and this kind of price action, when it kind of, everyone knows, like, there's, like, a level here at 550 from the, the, the pre-market. So, like, 540 kind of stuffed here. So, like, you know, if you missed it, it's kind of hard. That's why you just kind of, this is the kind of trade where you kind of have to, if you're going to short it, you're going to short it on this line. You're going to go small and like, just give it time. That's the kind of trade that you need to take with this kind of stock. I feel these kinds of like stocks with super obvious lines, but um, it, it's kind of like making it, making you look, making it look like it can break like this, like a consolidation kind of stuff. This small size and weight. <clears throat> and what was the other one? MOXE. Is that today? That one was today. No borrows on this one, I remember. Naturally. Oh, wait. Sorry. I woke up late. I woke up late, so there was no borrows for me. But um, there was probably some borrows, right? I, but I think there was only a little bit. I think there was only a little bit of borrows. I think I asked. So again, kind of a not no borrow situation. It just kind of died. Here's the thing, guys. Don't get don't get what what I'm saying is don't get comfy with this. 
this this kind of stuff does can't hang around for long. Like this kind of stuff won't won't just hang around for long. This is a trade where it's really hard to get in full size. Um, you 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 kind of have to have really tight risk and and it's kind of just got to work for you if you if you're gonna go full size here. The only way to make money on this kind of stock is through constant recycling. Um, didn't James have a video on this? I haven't seen it yet. Um, <clears throat> I think James did a live trade video on this. But yeah, the, the way to make money on this is to constantly recycle, keep shorting the pops, keep covering the drops um, until, until you kind of hit like 10 a.m. or something and, and you feel it's down a little bit too much. When you say there haven't been short like locates this last week, do you mean I'm using trade zero and they don't show how many shares are available to short? I just know when I get it when I get a bar on my small size of shares, I've had no problem to get in low cups and low cap. Well, the thing is, I mean, I don't know how expensive they are. I don't know what you've been locating, but um, overall, we've seen a, a, a like we've seen a drastic like we've seen a lot less plays and thus a lot more competitiveness over the plays that are there. And the and the like the runners that have been running have been very thin and not a whole lot available. So if you only want three hundred shares, you can probably get them, right? But like for like you know for about you know for a thousand traders to get five thousand shares each or something like that, that kind of stuff, that kind of supply just isn't around. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so those were some, I mean, it really wasn't a whole bunch. Uh, I, I remember IBIO. There was one good line trade on this. I, I had a couple people talk to me about this one. There was one good line trade on this one day on 260. And I felt this one good line trade right here. Again, I kind of wasn't watching. But you see this, this, we have this nice 265 line here. Well, the next day, we kind of we turn on. And here's the only trade I see on this day for me. The only trade I see here, and first of all, I wouldn't take this trade because the range is too tight for my, my, my liking. But we get up here to this 260, like you know you have a 265 over here. We don't have to draw it. But shit. You know, the stock pops up here. And this is where, um, let's not look at the whole chart. Yeah, the stock popped up here to 260s. And you start putting your orders up here. You get this pullback here to VWAP. And you cover that as the first resistance short at the 265 line. You call it good. You got your pullback to view up front side short, front side cover. This is clearly a front side move. You get the front side cover and you're done with the trade. You want to recycle it up here? You can try. You know, it pops back up to 260. You can, that maybe you recycle. Kind of a strong move. Kind of a strong move to recycle. Like the thing is, once this kind of base is here at 250, what are you going to do? You're going to short here 260 and cover what? 253? It's kind of hard. You're getting, and this is again why tight range is kind of tough. But you can go for the recycle. I, I think it broke. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. It, it did. Yeah, so you can go for that, right? And look, look at that. I didn't even know. I thought that just blew through. But yeah, you get your cover there at 263. You want to recycle that. Um, and there it is. And like, it's not going to, you know, the main trade is right here. This is the main trade. Like, for me, this is the most predictable move here on this day. But how's that? I didn't even guess that. It was like 253. Um, but yeah, it's like you get a little recycle there and it like you probably stop out. She's so hot. I don't get it. Oh. What, what time are we at? 204? Oh fuck. Oh, of course. Of course. White suit Padme beats Slave Leia any day of the week. Oh, of course. Beautiful is the word. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, we have? Good. Would you buy it at two? No, I wouldn't buy it at two. two, two. There, I, I just don't, I have no faith in the range. I don't like, I don't like buying these. These are very grindy ups. These stocks are kind of these stocks are very grindy ups. I don't like I don't really like them. Um anyway, so I think that was just most of the ones that I missed. There was really only a handful this week. Anyway, so it's time. Oh, no, not that one. Time to move on to the rant of the week. And this is basically just 
I'm going to bitch out everybody for trading shitty setups and then messaging me on like, what could I have done better here? Well, you, what you could have done better here is left. <laughs> right. Um, no, I'm kidding. Kind of not really. But um, yeah, like I've been getting a lot of DMs this week and like, I hate getting DMs when I'm just like, why are you even trading this in the first place? Like, like, what are you doing? Like, like, the, like I've been getting these DMs where like, man, like, is there anything I could have done different? Or like, like, you know, like, what did I do wrong here? And I just want to say what you did wrong here was you traded it in the first place. It's up 25% for God's sake. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> fucking Pepe memes, dude. They're so relatable to trading. It's not even funny. Yes. So anyway, oh my gosh, dude. I love Pepe memes. They're so funny. Um. Anyway, so what on earth are you guys fucking trading, guys? Like, I mean, being a full like Bow says it all the time. Being a full time trade trader doesn't mean trading full time. If there's no good plays, don't fucking trade. You are settling, right? Stops. Stop settling your trading, guys. Like, like literally stop making the best of a bad situation. You're in a bad situation, remove yourself from the situation, right? So, like, the thing is, is like, um, if, like, if you're an experienced trader and you have multiple levels of arsenals and you have like dead trading arsenals where as an experienced trader, you're sized down to 500 shares and you're looking for 50, 50 bucks scalps kind of to just like to pass the time, maybe pay off some of, maybe like pay off some of your borrow fees earlier in the month, you know, fine. Right. Like, you know, and you know that this isn't going to get to you, but like you're a new trader, first year trader, maybe even second year trader stick to your setups. And it, I promise they're not here. Like, I, like you're grasping at straws to find really good setups here. Right. You guys are just trying to like put it like, it's almost as if like you're used, like, no, that's not a good, this is not a good analogy, but it's like, if, if someone put anything on your plate, would you eat it? No. Right. Like you, just be, if, if someone put rocks on your plate, you wouldn't eat it. Right. Like you, you have to, you kind of have to have some objective standards, right? You need to have some objectivity in your assessment to trade. Otherwise the market is in control of you. The market is basically the market. Does the market get to decide what you trade? Like do, who's in control of your trading? Are you in control of your trading or is the market in control of your trading by just, you're going to trade whatever the market gives you. So if the market gives you shit, you're just going to trade shit, right? Like it's like, you know, you being able to say, no, I'm not trading this garbage means that you're more in control of your, your trading. It's, it's a way of being in control of your emotions when you just kind of try to trade the movers of the day, kind of whatever they are and try to make money on whatever's there. You know, like that's like, you need to be working on, you need to be working harder than that. Like you need to be, uh, re you have to be more focused. That's the word. You have to be more focused than that. Right. So, you know, like the thing is, is that what, what are you like, what you guys are trading in the best of a bad situation would be the crap stocks on an average day, right? Like you have already eliminated, like, you would like these stocks that you guys are trading and having a hard time with, you would have, you would have eliminated them from your watch list on a typical day. These are the stocks where they would have made the cut because they gapped. And then you would have been like, Oh no, not, not VBIV, not, not IBIO, not this one. I'm right. You would have, you would have, you know, like crossed these off, but yet here they are. They're the main watches today. Right. Where's the objectivity? You're totally letting yourself be subjective to whatever the market's throwing at you, right? So, oh, hold on. This, this line isn't supposed to be there. I forgot. This line isn't supposed to be there. The rant of the week. That line's not supposed to be there. That was, that was on another slide. Anyway, so so if you see a mod, right, or an experienced trader trading, right, and you're seeing them post chart or posting ideas, it doesn't mean that you should be, right? The difference is, is that mods are going to be very confident in their process. They, they you know, if they lose, they're not going to, it's not going to be devastating for them, right? Like if they lose on it, like they're like, 
they're either going to be like, oh, well, whatever. Like, because they have confidence in their ability to make money tomorrow. Whereas if when you, like, newer, younger traders are striving for your confidence, this is like, I mean, this is like just gambling. Like, you're, you're literally just, like, gambling your confidence away, right? Because, like, you lose on this trade and you're going to feel, like, bad tomorrow, right? Because you're still new. So, you know, you're not that confident in your process. So it's just not worth it, right? That's the difference, right? They're on a higher level. Experienced traders even that aren't mods are on a higher level. Do not compare yourself to them. If they're trading, I mean, gosh, shame on them for giving you FOMO, but shame on you for getting FOMO, right? You can't compare yourself, right? Experienced traders tend to have a lock on their system and they know if they're breaking their system or not. They, they, they like I said, they might have tools in their arsenal that they don't ever use really on a daily basis because they have better tools, but this could be a tool that they have scalping for five, 10 cents that they normally don't do, but now they're, they're pulling out this tool in their arsenal. Whereas you, it might not be a tool in your arsenal yet and you don't, don't use it, right? They may be using a tool or they may be breaking their process, right? And if they are breaking their process or giving into boredom, I'm not going to put it past any mod, including myself, to do such a thing. Do not copy their mistake, right? Don't copy our mistakes. If we fuck up and we shouldn't be trading something and we do, like, don't, don't, you don't have to take that loss with us, right? Like, just because, like, we can mess up too. Like, we can be giving into the boredom, giving into the FOMO. We do, right? We can break our process, especially if it's slow. Like, this is where everyone is most susceptible to. Just because we're breaking, it doesn't mean you have to, right? And they've probably sized down. Like, like probably every, every experienced trader I know has probably sized down in this time. Because right? they, uh, they just know that the opportunity is not as good. And, you know, you don't want to be trading as big when the opportunity isn't as good. Sure, sure. But don't, it doesn't mean that you have to, like, feel the need to trade just because they're trading. Sometimes we feel here, here, here's a little honesty. Sometimes we feel like we have to trade to, to kind of produce content a little bit. Like I, sometimes I feel that, like, I feel like, man, like I feel bad not trading, not posting charts, but like, fuck it. Like I don't want to lose either. Like, like I mean, that's just being honest. Like I have that FOMO. I have like content FOMO. Like I really do. I have content FOMO. Like, Oh man, like I got to, man, my trades have gotten a bit shitty. I better try to, I, I, and I force trades that way, just like, you know, oh, I haven't posted a, like a solid VWAP reclaim training in a while. Let me try to force this one. Like, yeah, I do. I get the content from a little bit. Something new that I picked up <laughs> that I've had to quell. Um, content FOMO sounds like an OnlyFans term. Uh, anyway, and so, yeah, there's a different, so there is differentiation noted ahead of time. I promise. Like there's differentiation in, in these trades versus the other trades. I promise every mod or experienced trader has this differentiated noted ahead of time. There are these double checks. There are, there is this size down. There is this check and balance. So stop settling guys. Like go for good setups. If you're a first bounce trader and there's no first bounces, what are you doing? All right. If you know, like if, if you're a first resistance shorter, yeah, you're probably getting some first resistance shorts. But, you know, like, if you're, like, a death candle shorter and, you know, there's not enough plays to give you a good death candle, like, what are you doing, right? Like, wait. Just wait. If you're an overextended trend break trader, right, if you like to trade over, is that, if that's one of your if, – if you're a trend break trader and you've got this, like, shitty effing stock, like, you know, like VBIV or the stock with itty bitty range and, and you're like, oh, look, it broke two cents under this line and now I, I can make seven cents to the bottom. What are you doing? Like not even a big enough trend to even consider it a trend break, right? So, yeah, so just, I mean, have some objectivity to your trading and don't give in, just wait. The, like better days are ahead of, ahead of us. So that's my rant of the week. Um, and now, so to get into full size, right? So if you, scale, and again, this is a little bit continuation of a rant from a webinar or two ago, but if you scale into every trade, this is likely you, you're never getting in full size. Basically, the only time you're ever going to get into full size for a winner is if the stars align, right? Um, and like Hercules, right? 18 years precisely, the planets will align ever so nicely, right? And this is, this is, the, this is the trader that scales up in between lines. 
um, and like, well, I'm going to have an order at, at 425, 450, 475, and 490 stop out at five. Um, <laughs> the only time you're going to get, the only time you're going to get full size is if it goes to 490 and tops out. <laughs> full size trade, 490 and tops out. And not five because five is a stop. So you have that 10 cent window where, you know, for, you know, or whatever, for, you know, for 40, 440, 60, 80, and 95, and you're stopping out over 510. You have this like 15 cent window of perfection where it has to go to 490, but not to 510 or, you know, or something, 495 and not 510, right? You, this, this star is the line kind of a um, way of you getting in full size if, you, if you're not willing to add to winners. Um, and so, uh, anyway, and so this is likely you if that's the case. But anyway, let me tell you that if you do not get the full size on any trades, you are going to, making a consistent profit on a weekly to monthly basis is going to be very, 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 very hard, right? And so, like, like I, I, I talked about this in the adding to winner webinar where basically the way I view trading is you have the halfies game and the full game and the, the half size game and the full size game and the half size game, these like ideally, like, you know, if you have a higher, higher win rate than a lose rate, you're going to be a little bit green over this, but where you're making your banks are from your full size trades. And, and by keeping the risk to reward, like keeping tight risk on your full size trades by having small full size losers, but big full size winners right? Full, full size winners, but tight to break even full size losers, right? And so this is how you're really going to be um, like just to, um, just to, um, I guess, remind, remind people who may not have seen it. I talk about this um, kind of like this. Yeah, this half size trade and full size trade, right? You know, like you're not making a whole lot like, like the the profit ratio that you get off the like, you know, like your small wins versus your small losses is like a profit factor of three. Whereas your full size is like a profit factor of seven. This is where you're, this is where you're banking your money here. guys. This is where you're banking your money is on the full size trades. And if you don't have any, you're basically just playing this game all day. You're playing this game all day with a profit factor of three, not to include locate fees or, or, or regular fees or, or, you know, like slippage, right? Those three things make it tough to win on the half size trades over time. You need these full size trades um, to, to be a winner. Uh, and so here's the thing. If you're only playing the half ace game and you have one big loss, you're, you're not going to be profitable. One big loss and like the half ace game is destroyed, right? So um, this is why risk management is key and why you need the full size winners. God forbid you have a big loss you know, you need to have a, one, like a big win to kind of compensate it and like a big win after to make money. And so you need to be in basically, like you need to be trading in full size. You can't always be in quarter and a half size positions. Like, and you know, you're just never, you're either never going to go anywhere or the big loss is going to um, create the red, the red month, basically that big, that big loss is going to create the red month. And, that doesn't even take into that doesn't even take into consideration the negative mental side effects of incurring another big loss because you just took a big loss that wiped away all of your profits from playing the halfies game for three weeks. You played the halfies game and like made a hundred bucks, 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 and then like lost twelve hundred, right? So you just lost all of your halfies game. But guess what? You might even be thinking like, oh, like I got the full size and took a big loss, and you know, that's why, uh, like, you know, like, I, 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 I'm red because of the big loss. Guys, if you have full-size winners, your account should even be able to sustain a big loss or two if you have a big win or two. Guys, like, part of the reason why you're not winning is not just because the big loss dwarfs the half, you know, all of your wins because the big loss is so much bigger – but it's because your wins are so much smaller than they could be because you're not in full size on any of your winners. Like imagine if half of your winners were full size winners, double, like you see how even one big loss might neutralize some of that, but it won't like erase everything. So you, 
you know, having your full size winners is vital to, to, to going anywhere. And what I mean by full size guys is not necessarily do rolls in like 5,000 shares and it just banked a dollar. Like, 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 it's not like that. It's, you know, like if you located a thousand shares and you only get 300 all the time, but when you lose your, it, you're, it's on like 700 to, to 2000. Yeah. You're never in full size. And so you're, you know, like your 30 cents that you make on 300 shares at 90 bucks that you make is a $90 on the day. Um, that's not going to, that's not going to help it when you're in a thousand shares and you lose 30 cents and lose 300. All right. Imagine if that, that 300 share win was on a thousand shares and say that because you added to your winner, you took away some of the average. And so that instead of making 30, 30 cents, you on average, you made 23 cents. Well, 23 cents on a thousand shares is 230. That's about like four times as much as that $90 when you would have got, you know what I mean? Or no, three times as much as that 90, uh, three to four times as much as that 90 when you would have got, right? So get into full size on, on some, try to get onto um, full size on some of these trades. What about setting R to an average winner? Um, I mean, essentially that's what you kind of want to do. Um, I mean, if the thing is, is measuring the R system is really hard because you, you have to be really honest about your risk and it's really hard for a trader, even a trader that wants to be honest about the risk to be honest about the risk reward that they're taking. So it's really difficult because um, when, when you measure R, it's like the, the, I essentially run an R system in my head. I have a, a trade dollar amount that I'm willing to risk and that's one R for me. Like that's one trade full risk. Right? That's one full risk trade and I'm willing to lose that on a trade and I hope to make at least that or more. So essentially that's what I have in my brain. I just kind of do it like mentally. But like, yeah, I don't, I don't have an R for average winner. I have an R for average loser and I try to base my wins off of that average loser. Right? So like, you know, an average loss for me is going to be X dollars. And so I try to base all of my gains based on that, that average R for my, not for my winner, but for my loser. Sunburn. Sunburn is the worst chat lips, dude. Um, where's my, anyway. Um, and so, and so here, one thing I really want to talk about is if you're always playing, if you're always the guy that's playing in between the lines game. And what I mean that the always in between the line game is, um, you're the trader who have, has decided that this is for you, that, um, as long as you have a level above where you can add, you're, you're in control. If that's not working for you, and I, I have doubts about its ability to be working for you, uh, ditch it, right? If you're, if you're always willing to add higher, that means that you're never getting any significant wins. You know, uh, someone messaged me this week, a couple of people messaged me this week and kind of talk to me about this. They're like, so like they, they showed me a chart where, um, you know, here, here's my average, you know, here's my target and here's my next entry. And the next entry was significantly higher. And I was like, wait a minute, why is that a next entry up there? How are you ever like, how are you going to withstand the trade going that high up? And if your target's down here, so you're going to take that, I'm just, I'm just doing the math. Like, like you're going to make 20 cents here and your next entry is like 30 cents higher, 30 to 40 cents higher. And your target's like 20 cents lower. So you can withstand going all the way up there because that's your next entry, right? You're, you're playing in between that. Like you're always fine. Like that's your next entry and you're going to make 20 cents if you win, but you're adding 40 cents higher. That ain't going to like, if that sounds like you where you always have another entry higher and that in, in order to stay trading like comfortably, like you, you trade so small in between so that like, as long as you feel like you can add higher, you don't have to lose on the trade. And that like, you're, you're always in this feeling of comfortability. I, you're never, you're never going to have any significant wins and thus you're going to go into this making a consistent profit on a weekly to monthly basis is going to be really, really, really hard. So if that's not working for you, it's time to ditch it right? The fallacy that if you're not in full, you don't have to lose that. That's what this stems from. It's a form of loss aversion. And this strategy is also cultivated by the fear of correlating full size with losing 
from the beginning of your trading when you go in full size, quickly lose and just be like, well, fuck, I never want to be in full size. Every time I'm in full size, I lose. And so you kind of have this like aversion to being in full size because you just correlate um, being in full size with the loss. Talk about soon. Yeah. Most people use scaling as an excuse not to get their full size positions, right? So it's easier for them to put on a hundred shares and just say they want to get, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Talking about two lines should be two orders, two covers. Yeah. That's because every exit, right? I've said this before. Your, your entry is decided by your exit. And you know, like if you can't get the same exit with the same entry, that means they should be different trades. So if you have a short at 250 and you want to cover 220 and you have another short at $3, do you think that you can get 220? If you can't get 220, they need to be different trades. All right, because that your exit defines your entry, right? The 220 exit defined the 250 entry. That 250 entry is invalid once you don't think you can get 220 anymore. If you don't think you can get 220 anymore, that 250 entry is invalid. And you don't want to be just holding on to that 250 for dear life. Yay, I'm going to three. Like, let's go to three and just get rope burn. You're just going to get rope burn and just going to cause it. What if three just blows right through? Wouldn't you have liked to have cut that 250 at 255? You know, like, so, and that's what causes the big loss. And, got, and let's say you would have got the win. So what were the situations there? You, you took this big loss or you got, that tw you got that 20 cents on half size, right? You made that 100 bucks on a 500 share position. But the other 500 was at three, and now you have a 275 average, and you covered 310, and you just lost 500 bucks. So how does that work, right? That, that, that's what causes the big loss and the half. When you only have half wins, and that big loss, I mean, it's just impossible to make money. So you, the, 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 the change that needs to happen here is you guys need to be getting into full size more often. And so that, that's the problem. And so, well, it might not be a short webinar, maybe. Anyway, so first, before we get into how to get into full size, let's go over quickly how to not be in full size. Premature setups, premature setups, premature setups. Most of the times I see traders, um, um, get to full size before their setup is complete and thus they are forced to stop out before their thesis is invalidated or at max pain or both. Right. And so, uh, I don't know why that was animated for some reason that was animated. Um, <laughs> I, I normally don't add animations, but anyway, um, so parabolic washouts, parabolic shorts and washout longs. Don't be the fucking hero. These are not big. These are not full size fucking trades. Right, they're not full size trades. This is how this is how you blow up accounts, right? When the parabolic doesn't end and you're just gearing up. So don't these these are not full size. If you want to be full size on a parabolic, you ease into it, and then once you think the top's in, you slam it, risk the high. That's the only way to get into full size on a parabolic. But most of the time you don't get into full size. Most of the time you ease into the parabolic and it just falls drastically on you and you just be like well fuck you scramble the cover that's how parabolics really work like for experienced traders alike that's how parabolics work you ease into the trade and it just normally like if you get a chance to slam it you do but normally it just pulls back so fast and you just fuck let me cover right and that's how that happens um so immediately at the death line cross you don't want to be just slamming it here this is the like wait for that to confirm give it five minutes like if it's gonna put it this way if you're going to be right on a death line setup, you're going to be right. It's going to keep going lower. There's no rush to get to full. Like make sure it breaks. Give it five minutes. Give it five, 10 minutes. Get in on, add it, ease in on pops. Get the full size on that. Like go slow with that one because you don't have to be fast. If it's going to, if you're going to be right, it's going to fade. You don't, there's no rush because death lines don't just drop, drop, drop. That's not the way death lines go. They trickle. There's time. Right. So because there is time, there's no need to be in full immediately. The only like you're not getting any benefit for getting for, in a death line. There's no benefit to getting in full size right away. There's really just risk. You're, you're risking that it's that it kind of just it's testing more and pops back over. Now you're fucked. Now you have the bottom average. So 
Immediately death line cross, that's not when to get full size. Near the top, near the bottom with tight wrist. I, I normally don't like to do this um, be, be, I, like because you're just going to get stopped out. You're going to get stopped out way more times than it's going to work. Uh, and you're going to be emotional because th there's a reason why. Because right at the tops and right at the bottoms, this is where the, the emotion is at the peak. The emotion is always at the peak at the very top and at the very bottom. This is where um, stocks are very emotional. So it's right at the top. Dude. You think you're just going to risk the high day. You're going to cover the high day. It's going to pop over high day by three cents, stop you out and then come back lower. God forbid you reshort it. Maybe it goes down or maybe it does that to you again. And then, or maybe it goes for a ride this time and you think it's going to stuff and it doesn't. And then you're really fucked. So just don't try to be that guy who says, Ooh, I think this is the top full size. Tight wrist though. Tight wrist though. Oh shit. It got me out. Oh shit. Look, it tanked. No shit. Like you're tr like, you're, you're just too big. Like you're trying to guess the top. Don't do that. Man, I'm going to lose my voice today. On, the, on an initial chase entry, right? And so, guys, I chase sometimes. I normally chase to add. Like normally, like, a lot, like the chase entries that you'll see on my charts, they're normally over, like they're, they're normally not random chases. They're normally, you know, over like a high. But still, it's kind of chasey sometimes. It's normally not my first entry, and if it is my first entry, it's not full. So going short or long, a chase entry can maybe get you to a full size position, like if you added to get to the full size position. But it, it should never stand alone be a full size position ever. <clears throat> it's just too much risk. And anyway, I've gone over easy risk before. I really should have done a webinar on easy risk um, in the first sixty episodes I did, but I've kind of talked about it in every single webinar almost about easy risk so it's almost like it's almost like it's been the invisible webinar but trades with hard risk where you can't really determine where the risk is you don't want to be full size in them if you can't figure out like easily where the risk should be or it's or it's kind of far away you know it's not ideal not ideal risk where it's it's just not easy to, to risk that level that's not a full size trade also when you're frustrated in a toxic mentality these are not, these are not full size. Anyway, so by comparison, these are setups I, I fell, that I fell deserve, uh, that I feel deserve full size entries. First resistance shorts. The whole point of this trade is to get in right there. Like you're, you're shorting, assuming that it's going to hold. You have a nice, you know where your risk is and you're expecting a pullback. That's a full size trade. Um, a first bounce. This is a full size trade. Um, I mean, you scale in, but you try to scale into a full size position. This is one of the rare times that I will. Um, I have a caveat to this, though. So. Um, scalps, you don't want to be scaling into scalps, right? I mean, you want to scalp, you hit it, right? You hit the scalp, you go for the scalp, and it's normally one to one, and you take it, right? Um, low hanging fruits, you don't want to be the guy, the person who just scales forever into low hanging fruits. Pick a good line and just go with it, like one or two entries, maybe. But like, try to get the full on your low hanging fruits, right? Like, don't don't just try to scale to infinity because I promise you're gonna you're gonna be the guy who all of your low hanging fruit trades you get 100 shares because there's 20 levels and you tried to get them all. And anyway, so let me let me disclaim when I say full size. I, when I say full size for these setups, I mean full size for how much you allot to these. Now I'm gonna say these trades. I typically don't allot. Uh, I don't allot as much risk as I do other setups. Like a VWAP reclaim, I will allot more risk, right? Um, a simple short, I will allot more risk. Um, trend breaks, I will allot more risk. Like a lot, like A L L O T, not like a lot of risk. Um, but um, I'll, I'll um, budget more risk, maybe that's less confusing. But those will be bigger trades for me, basically, than these. Um, with the exception of the first bounce, right? So the first bounce, it's, it's funny. The, so the, the easiest way I can say this is if uh, I'm normally willing to go 120% of my size on the first bounce, and that's because out of all of the scaling trades that I do where I might scale into a first bounce, um, if I am going to scale into it, I have such confidence in the first bounce that I'm normally willing to go more size on it than normal. And so it, the first bounce almost becomes a full like a bigger trade for me just because it's such a good and easy setup that I want to go as big as I feel comfortable with 
while scaling. Like normally I have a rule where I won't scale more than 50% on, you know, as price is going against me. First bounce, I, I'm willing to go 60 to 70%. And then I hope I can get an ad to get to 120 to 140 based on like how much, like how, you know, how the stock lets me. So like, you know, like if an average setup for me is like, if I'm going to go a thousand shares, for example, and that would mean that I can only scale 500, I'll probably scale like 600 to 750 on a first bounce and then look to add 600 to 750 once the bottom's in, if it gives me that opportunity. Um, that's just with the first bounce though. That's not like on a parabolic short. That's not on a washout. That's just on the first bounce because it's such a high probable, high probable setup. But that's about it. Normally these are less, these aren't my biggest trades is what I'm saying, but they, I do have all the size that I have on them when I do take them. Like all the size I want, I get them. Uh, I don't just scale into infinity on these um, and then accept whatever size I have. That's more of a parabolic short for me. Like I scale into parabolics. That's whatever size I get when it drops, I'm going to get. I don't want that kind of trading strategy to be all of my trading strategies, like my trading execution strategy for every single trade, or I'm never going to get full size ever. And so when and how to get full size. So getting to full size is an art, right? Like you have to manage flexibility and rigidity, right? That, that kind of mold that I like to talk about every trader in the world. I'm going to say, once they get to full size, Every single trader in the whole fucking world, the sh like, like, like you, you're willing to scale up to a thousand shares and you start 100, 200, you add another 200, right? So what are we at? 400. Um, you add another 200, 600, and then you slam 400 thousand shares. You're waiting for the trade to fucking work like uh, two minutes ago, right? Like the second a trader gets the full size, they, they, they get antsy. Every trader gets antsy. Like they want the trade to go. They want the trade to go right now. Like, like hurry up. Like, you know, they get jittery. This is, you're, 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 you're human. And so knowing that, um, this is, this is kind of like my secret here, um, that I employ. Right. And I use the term secret. Like, I don't like the, like the whole, marketing shit but this is my secret i don't like to get into full size until i see where i would have stopped out if i was impatient so i like to just watch a stock as it's going and i might scale into it a little bit i might have a small position on or like like for me no more than half um i, I, I might have a position on there's no way in hell that i'm getting into the full until i see where i would have stopped out if i was in full size so for example, like works, I, I, I'm just willing to bet a lot of traders stopped out here. This is a situation where I might not have stopped out. Um, you, if you don't stop out, like if, if you're like, if you shorted here in the fifties and sixties on like no more than half size, then this can pop up here to 260. You can be fine. You can be like, Oh, I know like if you're the trader that's like, Oh, I know this good stuff, but I have to stop out anyway. Then that, if you ever had that thought, like I know, it could stuff here, but I have to stop out anyway. Those words, I have to stop out anyway. That means that you're probably in full size prematurely. That means that there is a supply and demand battle that a supply and demand battle is obvious here. And you can't withstand the loss if you're going to lose because you're in too big. And so, um, waiting for your stop level to be tested first. Um, cause normally this test will be on big emotion. You don't, you want to be in an emotionless state. And the only way you can do that is without the size and wait for the big supply and demand battle. That's obviously going to occur at this stop out level. Um, wait for that battle to happen. Wait for the victor to be decided. Um, and let me tell you something about obvious stop loss levels. Stop, a lot of stop loss levels, even the ones I like to use are obvious, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily the wrong stop out levels to use. I might want to have a stop at high of day and the high of day stop is a good stop for me to have. Is it obvious? Of course it is. Of course it's obvious, right? That's, I still want to stop out there if we break 
And what I mean by that is if the supply and demand battle that's going to happen at high of day, if I'm short and the, the, and the buyers win, I want to be cutting it. It's a good stop. Like if the longs, if the longs win that battle, that's, I want to stop out there as a short, right? But there, it might be necessary for me to sit through that battle um, and take advantage if the shorts win that battle, if, if the short, if my team wins that battle. And once that battle occurs and a victor is decided, once you wait, if you can wait until you see this move first, that's what's called confirmation. And now you can add to a full size position, risking over the, wherever the battle was won or lost and be confident that if that level reclaims, that you're done, that the trade's over, and it becomes what I call easy risk. And that's why I only like going in full size on trades that have easy risk. And the, and the best way is to um, identify where the supply and demand, the, the, the crucial, let me tell you something, guys. Here's another secret. The crucial supply and demand battle that you're basing your stop off of is going to happen. It's going to happen. Don't be like, oh, this is my stop. I hope it never gets tested. <laughs> it's going to get tested. Every time you place a stop, assume it's going to get tested. Assume it's going to go get tested. Don't ever place a stop and be like, I hope it never goes and touches it. Don't ever be that guy. It's going to go there. So be, just don't get in full size before it gets tested. Like that, That's the secret is wait for a stop level that you want to use wait for that stop level to get tested and then you can slam it with size once you think your team won right you were the bottom cover on three stop losses i three then bounce that's unfortunate but it, i mean that's because it's there's a battle going on and the, the frustrating thing is that you were right when you you were right but you couldn't sit through the battle because you were in too big right? But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't not get in once you get your confirmation, right? And so this comes down to size management. I normally like to be in half, half in before, just in case the battle doesn't happen. Obviously, then it can still be a decent size win on half. It can be a happy. But another reason is it's always easier to add in half, like add half and double the size or in two quarters, like to be in 500 shares and hit 250 and then 250 again, right? Like that's easy. It's, it's easy to get in that way. It's easy. You know, it's just easy. It's really hard to be in 250 and then slam 750. You know what I mean? That's kind of hard. So that's like the secret with, um, that I use when it comes to getting into full size. And this is an example. It works, right? You just wait for this and then you can hit it. It doesn't even matter how fucking low you hit it. Like if you shorted half up here, right? Sat through the stuff and you shorted it 240. Dude, you got a 245 average, bro, and it's a 230. You're cruising. You're in the driver's seat. You, you, know, you have your risk under control. You can risk 10 cents. You have a full-size position, and you're ready to go, right? But there's so many ways to fuck up this trade. You go in full-size and cover here. You, know, you go in 200 shares, and now you're too scared to short 800 down here because now your average is going to be like 237. Yeah, that's a way to fuck it up is not being in big enough before – you know, like there's a lot of ways to fuck it up or mentally psych yourself out or be like, oh, I, you know, I think VWAP's going to hold like when it just stuff like that. But, you know, like that's why it's good to, you know, like not be in full size. There's a, there's a method like wait for your stop level to be tested, be in some already to kind of have a feel and then slam on the confirmation. If you're using hard stops, would you say 50% or below size to get a hard stop farther? Yes. Right. Hard or mental, really. It's like, basically, you're in smaller, you can give it the... Here's... Bao likes to say um, small size, wide risk, or, or, or I like to say it too. You go, you go, if you go big size, you have tight risk. If you go small size, you can widen your risk and you can be more patient, right? I like to be in a size that's just patient enough for me to sit through the critical battle I feel I need to sit through. That's, that, that, that's, that's the line I want to walk, right? I want to walk to where I can lose the battle and it won't be a devastating loss, whatever size that has to be, uh, half size, 30%, whatever it is. Um, 
like whatever or depending on like where the battle is from where my average is too that that obviously plays a role but like um wherever the crucial battle i think needs to happen i want to be in a small enough percentage size of my position to where i can i just barely can sit through the battle uh, that i think i'm gonna win but if it doesn't win then i'm fine that it's an okay loss but if i you know so that way it's easy for me to slam once i do win and um uh, if the battle doesn't happen it's still like i'm i, I was on the brink of you know still a big enough position to make a decent profit whenever in person meetup happens i guess austin's isn't paying for drinks oh how come i mean i don't yeah i mean seltzer yeah, I'm a cheap date, dude. But anyway, so I think I wanted to go over oh, 245. I wanted to go over CVIX, something like this, right? So, and so what I talk about size management is key here. This is the slide I wanted to go over. So this is a, so this is a good example, right? 409, where are we right here? We're right here, right? We're right here. Like, this is 10, this is 10, 10, 30. All right, so this is 10, 10, 10, 10, 20, no, 10, 30, 10, 15, 10, 05, 10. We are right here, right? So we're just pulling in, we're just pulling in here. Oh, no, we're right here. 10, 30, 15, 10, this big green volume spike. Okay, we're on this big green volume spike. So this is a good example right here of how you can use risk management. If I was short CGIX, I would be covering dips on nine in case it holds. Right, and I talked about CJX before on how I think it's a short, but if you're over VWAP, you shouldn't have size, right? Because there's too many battles that you have to sit through before you're confirmed correct, right? You don't know who's going to win those battles. But right here, when it's spiking up, I said if I was short, I would be covering the dip to nine, right? This dip to nine in case nine held, because then if it decided to break nine and just tank nine and go to like 850 or VWAP, guess what? If it breaks nine, I can put shorts back on to nine. Like if I were to cover 905 and it popped back up and like if I covered half, let's say I covered half, I covered half at 905 and then it tanks and I get a short at 895. How much of average did I lose, right? What am I trading here? I lost... Uh, some of you might say I lost 10 cents of average. I didn't. I lost five cents of average because I, I did it with half, right? I covered half and then it tanked and then it popped back and I put half back on. So it's 10 cents total, 905 to, to 895, but it's on half size. So I only sacrificed five cents of average. I'm sacrificing five cents of average to take half of my risk off the table in case nine holds while when we're above VWAP and uptrending, that is a trade off. I, I will trade five cents of my average to reduce half of my risk when I'm above VWAP on a, on a grinding stock like this any day of the week. That is a trade that you should take every single day of the week. That is a trade off. Like dude, like you want this or that, right? Like the blue pill or the red pill. That's the pill I'm taking every time I'm sacrificing five cents of average. Cause like, if you, you know, like if you're wrong, you can probably get the pop back up, right? That's a trade. That's a trade off I'm going to accept. And look, it did hold. And guess what? What if, and if you didn't like, are you covering up here? And so here's the thing guys, you might say like, look, 1025, look, I wouldn't have covered. It didn't break pre market height. Let me tell you why the emotions get heightened here. Like we don't think about it um, outside of the moment. This is why weekend trading is so much easier to in the moment trading. Um, in the moment, or when we're looking at this chart, we say, oh, look, 1025, I can hold through that. No, but when the stock is up here, the bid is at 1024, and the ask is, is threatening 1050, 1060, right? That's what's going on at high of day. Like, you're not emotional because you're like, oh, I might have to stop out here at 1030. No. The fear is that it's going to rip 1030. You're not covering till 1055. So you're like, you're throwing on an extra 30 cents of risk there. Like that's the fear that's in your mind. People, we don't like to think about the fact that part of the fear comes from the ask, the, the threatening ask when you're short up there. And so 
The thing is, that's why you cover here because you can mitigate your risk. And when this, that, now you can sit through. Now when you covered half, guess what? You can sit through that 1025 test, that threat of 1050, you can accept it, right? And then when it rejects and breaks 950 again, look, you could put your short back, if you covered half at 905 and shorted at 905, that's a complete wash. That's a wash. That means that you didn't cover it at all. You didn't lose any average, right? If you cover it at 905 and eventually we shorted at 905, that's the exact same trade. But guess what? You avoided all of this risk. And God forbid it broke. You avoided all of that on half the size. So yeah, and that's what I went over there. How would I modify upsizing and downsizing? Um, you just have to, you just have to not, so this was if you were already in full size. The way you modify that is you just don't get the full size until you get this kind of move. That, that's what you do. You just don't get the full. I would, that was, this was under the impression that you were already full, which you shouldn't have been. But if you did, I would have covered it and then reshorted it. But the way you fix it, if you're not, if, you know, if you're not, if you're under PDT, you just don't get the full, you don't make that first mistake in the first place. You just don't get the full until this kind of move happens. Anyway, so my voice is shot, guys. I think that's all I got. My voice is so shot. <laughs> it wasn't that short of webinar. I thought it would be short because I didn't really have any trades, but it wasn't. Oh. Well, thanks, guys. Right on. Right on, guys. All right, man. I don't, there is no cities where I live. I'm on Maui. Well, thanks guys. All right. Let's do this here. Right on.